Hello everyone, this is Dragon here, back in the Dragon's Den. Pull up a seat and choose a drink of your choice. We are diving into some unique histories again this week, as I've been having a lot of fun going through the History Extra websites. That's where I'm getting kind of all my sources, and I stumbled across one that's interesting. It sort of occurs during the Twitter period of England. Um, however, the story takes place in Ireland do with that information as you will. But it seems really intriguing. The article uh, title definitely got me and I can't wait to dive into this. So without further ado, we are going to be reading the story, the article called Grace O'Malley, the Fearless Pirate Queen of Ireland. That's right, the Pirate Queen of Ireland. So I'm very excited about this, although I will apologize in advance because I'm very bad at Irish names. I know I should be somewhat good at it at this point because I lived in the UK for two years, but uh, no, I'm very sorry. So if I say her name wrong or incorrectly, it'll be in the description and you can correct it for me. There we go. So let's begin. I'm going to just do like what I did last week, go through the article and read it like a story. I'll react to different key elements and parts, and please feel free to react below in the comments too. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this pirate queen. So let us begin. Biographer Anne Chambers helps Emma Slattery Williams uncover the true story of Ireland's pirate queen, Grain Grain. That's hmm, I don't like this name. Grainimiai, uh, It's anglicized as Grace O'Malley. So her anglicized name is Grace O'Malley. So we'll call her that. And share some fascinating facts about her life. Alrighty, here we go. Grace O'Malley had given birth just hours earlier, but as she stood on the dock of her ship, the fearless pirate queen knew there was no time to rest. A band of other pirates had attacked and boarded her vessel, and she had to lead her crew against them and protect her newborn son. O'Malley grabbed her sword and rallied her men to for a counterattack. By the time the fighting was over, she had captured the other pirate ship for herself. A fascinating description was recorded by Sir Henry Sidney, Lord Deputy of Ireland, who met O'Malley in 1577. A most famous feminine sea captain, famous for her stoutness of courage, commanding three galleys and 200 fighting men. This was a most notorious woman in all the coasts of Ireland. Uh, Grace O'Malley led her own fleet with hundreds of men, spent nearly a lifetime at sea, and came face to face with one of the most powerful monarchs of the age, a woman she regarded as an equal. Very intriguing start here. She seems indeed quite fearless, especially if she had just given birth and then had to go fight off some parrots, pirates. Not parrots, although if it's the kind of cartoon version of a pirate, maybe parrots. Uh, she had to fight off pirates shortly after giving birth, and wow, that's that takes some strength and gall, so well done to her. And even to be recognized by a Lord Deputy of Ireland, that's pretty neat, and I can't wait to kind of dive into more of the story, so who, let's keep going. Who was Grace O'Malley? I'd like to know that as well. Born in around 1530 in County Mayo in Western Ireland, O'Malley was the only daughter of Chieftain Dudara O'Malley of the Kingdom of Umhal. Ireland had its own distinct legal system known as Brehon Law, in which chieftains were elected instead of the title being passed down by primogeniture. Uh, I think that's probably just part of the patriarchy, so going to the firstborn son. Yeah, I figured. The more forceful chieftains used the system of clientship, where they offered protection to the smaller clans in return for service and fealty. Sounds kind of right, you know, I'll protect you if you join with me. Bartering, negotiations, that's pretty typical for back then, for sure. <laughs> Women in Ireland, while far from being treated as equal to men, could inherit and hold lands in their own right, and even divorce their husbands. 
they could not, however, become chieftains. That's quite crazy, because that's almost, it's not equality, absolutely not, but thinking back in that time period and how long ago it was, that's actually remarkable that Ireland had that. Because most places in the world at that time were like, nope, you have to be loyal to your man and husband, and you have to, you know, take care of the house, do this, but they could own land, they could have, have ownership, and they could divorce their husbands, which is crazy, especially with uh, how Ireland becomes very, like, Catholic and Christian later on. Very interesting there. Cool. So. O'Malley was the exception to this last rule, a woman, according to Grace O'Malley's biographer Anne Chambers, who broke the mold. The O'Malleys were a seafaring family who traveled across oceans to trade, taxed for fishing in their waters, occasionally plundered, and controlled coastal castles to protect their lands in Western Ireland. As a girl, O'Malley grew up at Belclare, Ca Belclare Castle and Clare Island, receiving a formal education to the extent that she could speak Latin as fluently as her native Irish. Whoa. I keep breaking the mold, absolutely, to get fully educated as a woman in that time period is remarkable. Already going against the mold and expectations of being a lady just by getting a formal education. I am very intrigued. Let's keep going. <laughs> Yet, she also grew up on the sea and was determined to follow her family's bearing. When O'Malley was told she could not join her father on a sailing expedition, as her long hair would get caught in the ship's ropes, she cut it short and forced him to take her with him. Damn. Kind of a Mulan story there a little bit, although she didn't look like, she didn't, she wasn't trying to look like a man to join the army and fight for her uh, father's honor. It's still like, I belong on the sea. I deserve to be on the sea. I will do anything I can to be on the sea. And she cut her hair. Which again is pretty like, oof, taboo back in that time period. Because long hair meant health and, you know, that you were quite well off, really. So that's good for her. Damn. I'm, <laughs> this is really cool. I'm just thinking about history itself and how even to this day, like women are very, we're treated quite wrong and she's just standing out. She just goes against it. She's like, I don't care. I, this is what I want to do. I'm going to go do it. Very rebellious, but I think she grew up in a family that was lucky and kind of let her do it. So Good for the family, good for her. Pretty interesting stuff here. Uh, oh, here we go. I lost place in the article momentarily. <laughs> my, my apologies. Here we go. At 15, O'Malley was married off to Donald O'Flaherty, the heir of a neighboring chieftain. Ooh, look at that, getting some more power. With him, she had three children, two sons, Owen and Mur Murray, and a daughter, Margaret, and learned more of seafaring and piracy. When Donald was murdered by members of a rival clan in 1560, O'Malley took charge of her late husband's lands and ships. Ooh, interesting. Sad. I wouldn't want to lose a husband, but she got more power. Uh, interesting. The Joyces, the clan believed to be responsible for Donald's death, thought his castle would be open to capture with no one to protect it. What they had not expected was that Donald's widow would lead his men in defense. Oh, snap. So yeah, she really defended her man's honor, <laughs> which again is quite cliche a little bit, but back in this time period, yeah, if you see woman with a sword, it's like, whoa, what are you doing? Leave this to the men. But she rose to the occasion and led them. I, uh, I'm kind of falling in love with this pirate queen a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. <sighs> okay. So O'Malley returned to her father's land with those of Donald's men who remained loyal to her and made Clare Island her stronghold. 
Starting with three galleys, she embarked on a career of piracy on the high seas. This is where the legend of the Pirate Queen was born, explains Chambers. And during danger and hardship by land and especially by sea, O'Malley's maritime skill gave her role as a leader a double edge. It took immense skill and courage to ply the dangerous Atlantic Ocean and to withstand the physical hardships of life at sea. It is her leadership at sea that sets Grace O'Malley apart from every other documented female leader in history. Yeah, there's a lot of good elements in that description from her biographer. Just again, enduring the danger of hardship, because back then, travel, sea, being having a ship that was clean and fighting off disease and hunger and not being able to really have direction per se uh, to where you were going, you just sort of had to follow the currents and go in a general direction at some points phenomenal that she could endure all that plus then the leadership within her how she rose to the ranks and just i not really rose to the ranks just took charge no one else was there to take charge so she did that's phenomenal that is really almost inspiring in a way i mean i don't want to go down a road to piracy i don't think i'm made for that life personally but just to stand up and be a leader when there was no leader is really phenomenal. Now we get into the actual Fierce Pirate Queen story. So Fierce Pirate Queen is our next section here. A fearless leader and also a vengeful warrior, O'Malley did not let any attacks against her go unpunished. When Hugh de Lacy, the man she took as a lover after rescuing him from a shipwreck in 1565, was killed by the MacMahon clan of Duna Castle, O'Malley took violent retribution. Well, yeah. It's like, pause right there for a second. That's the second man that she's had killed due to another clan. That's the second man that she's loved. Well, we don't know if she really liked Donald before, but it's the second man that she loved or had affection, had a relationship with that was killed by another clan. Of course there'd be like that buildup of rage and wanting to get revenge. So yeah, I, I get that. Taking violent retribution makes sense. Do I have that backbone in me to do that? No, but good on her. When the MacMahons visited a nearby island, O'Malley was lying in wait with her men and killed all of those involved in De Lacey's death. Her vengeance still not sated. She then defeated the garrison at Duna Castle and claimed it for herself. Oh, damn. It wasn't enough just to get rid of those men that killed her man. She had to go for their whole stronghold, the whole castle, their lands and everything. That's fierce. There is the fierceness there. I think we can see it now, but it, there's more. <laughs> Here comes more. By 1566, so one year after this revenge took place, O'Malley was married again, this time to Richard the Iron of Bork. It's believed that the strategic strength of his castle, Rockfleet, was a motivating factor for the shrewd pirate queen. Bork, a member of the powerful MacWilliam family, made a perfect political match. The pair entered into a trial marriage. These were common in Ireland and allowed either party to withdraw after a year. Interesting. A trial marriage. Can we bring that back? Um, that's really an interesting concept. Try it out for a year. If it doesn't work, then just part your ways and have a child divorce question mark or just end the trial. But then if you guys are going well and growing stronger and have more um, affection, then you stay together. That's a really nice concept to think about. <laughs> I wish that was sort of still present in societies <laughs> around the world. Uh, anyway, I got distracted by that, but trial marriage, this idea of a trial marriage seems really cool. So, uh, not either party to withdraw after a year, and when 12 months had elapsed, O'Malley and her men locked her husband out of Rockfleet and demanded a divorce with the words, 
I dismiss you. Despite that, the pair would reconcile and remain together for almost 20 years. Wow. She's just like, nah, you know what? I don't want you. I want your castle. I want your land. I want your power. I need to have more in my life. Get out. I dismiss you. But then later down the road, they reconciled and remained together. That is really funny. That shows you who had the pants in the relationship, really. Oh, I love that. Oh, I really do. <laughs> That's really interesting. Okay, so O'Malley had a son by Bork named Tippet. Anglicized to Teobald. Okay, interesting. Uh, Tippet. He was born in 1567 aboard one of O'Malley's ships as Barbary pirates were bearing down. Such was her leadership that the captain pleaded with O'Malley to be seen on deck and rally her men just hours after the birth. Wrapping her son in a blanket and in some pain, she roared out commands and fired at her enemies before returning to Teobald. Yeah, that was back in the first part of this article too, where just hours after birth, she went up deck and commanded and fought against the pirates that were aboard her ship. So, yeah, such was her leadership. I don't, I guess it would be a really good indication of her leadership and her style by pushing through that immense pain of childbirth and fighting. It also kind of makes her sound a little crazy, but if you are very protective of what you're doing and very passionate about piracy and having this power and control, then of course you'd do anything to make sure that you wouldn't lose. It was all about winning for her. That is really interesting. Cool. Carrying on here, this is about 13 years later, so in 1580. And with his wife's help, Bork became the heir to the chiefdom of Mac William. It was around the same time that the English intensified their conquest of England. That's right, Elizabeth's, Elizabeth I, Lord Deputy of Ireland, Sir Henry Sidney, divided up County Mayo into, into baronies and demanded that the chieftains submit to English law and accept the arrival of sheriffs in their lands. Sounds like the English for sure. Sorry. <laughs> Damn. So yeah, they just basically did what they usually do in England, where uh, imperial control, they went over, divided things, drew their own borders, drew their own land borders and areas, and just said, you have to deal with it. Man. <laughs> uh, McWilliam agreed. Oh. So, Burke became the heir to the chief of McWilliam, but McWilliam them himself agreed. But O'Malley knew what this meant for her husband. Under English law, the heir would now be the eldest male relative instead of Burke. To win over Sydney, O'Malley offered him the services of her fleet. He was duly impressed, and Rockfleet maintained a degree of autonomy from English control. Oh, so she did it for her husband. Because yeah, back then you can name who the heir would be. It doesn't have to be your firstborn son or your nearest relative. It could be just whoever has proved themselves. But with the English taking over and how they ran things, it's based on like patriarchy, matriarchy, that kind of thing. So her husband would lose that heirship. And so she just offered her offered this Brit. Uh, her services and allowed that area to maintain autonomous from English control. Well, that is interesting. She really did love this guy, or at least, you know, cared about his position. We don't know about love per se, but he, she definitely cared about maybe his position and probably hers as well. Uh, if she was that kind of a fierce leader, which definitely sounds like it. This is a really interesting story. It really is because it just goes against everything we know of that time period. She just has really went against the status quo, the mold, the 
typical, this is how things are done, deal with it kind of thing. She just went against all of it. And I was like, I'm not doing that. No way. I really like that. I like that a lot. Uh oh. This next section title's interesting. <laughs> it's uh it's called Making New Enemies. This would be really interesting and traffic outside is very loud. I apologize if you can hear my traffic outside. Damn, people just drive slow. Uh, anyway. Making new enemies. So O'Malley returned to life on the high seas, but a failed attempt to plunder from the Earl of Desmond in Munster ended in her capture and imprisonment. Oh, shit. Desmond, who was under suspicion of being part of a plot against Elizabeth I, handed O'Malley to the English to gain favor. She was held in the dungeons of Dublin Castle until early 1579, when she secured her release. The details of how remain a mystery. Huh. I like how they phrase it, though. When she secured her release. Not anyone else but her. She herself did. O'Malley responded by attacking English ships and routing the army sent to besiege her castle. There's our girl. Yeah, be like, huh. I escaped the English. I don't want the English to take over my lands, the things I've fought for from my entire life. Screw that. Uh, I'm attacking them. I'm going to break all proper rule and just go for it. Yeah, girl, you got this. I love it. When the chief of MacWilliam died in 1580, Bork and O'Malley went into rebellion to exert their right to succeed. They mustered a huge army, including the elite Scottish mercenaries called the Galloblasts, and forced the deal to grant Bork the title. <laughs> All about the whole English history is such a mess, but the fact that they're like, yes, yeah, screw the English, and there's a rule that currently took place over their county, we're going to go with the Scottish to go against the English. Part of that makes me really happy for some reason. So they managed to basically cause a threat, and uh, they struck a deal, so now her husband, Bork, has the title. O'Malley, considered by many to be the real power behind her husband, let's be real, that's true, became Lady Bork, and remained a woman to be feared. Huh, so she actually did change her name. To have that title, to have that power. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> One story says she threatened an English tax collector and sent him running even after Bork had agreed to pay. <laughs> I love that. Oh, why is there not a movie about her? I need a movie. Some visual action behind this would be so great. Just all of these things that, like, her husbands, her lovers, her past relationships did, and then her stepping in going, uh-uh, that's not the way it is. This is the way it's going to be. Brilliant. I love this. <laughs> Sends a tax collector running. That's great. But O'Malley's position would not last long. Uh oh. As her husband died in 1583. So only really three hours, or three hours, three years of rule uh, that they had in this area of Ireland. Oof, okay. Man, she said many of her men die. No wonder she's all fierce and like screw the world kind of attitude right now because uh, a previous husband with the three kids, lover, and now this guy who she has a son with. Damn, that sucks. Finding herself a widow again, she took what she was owed of her husband's property and one of his castles in lieu of her dowry and established herself with her army and ships at Rockfleet. Her ability to lead and command respect was evident in the number of number of who men followed her. That, that's poorly written there. In the number of men who basically followed her. So despite her husband dying and losing that position, she still went back and fought for it, and kept it, and had like a, apparently a pretty decent army with her to defend this area, to defend Rockfleet that came with the marriage of her husband. I like that. That's really interesting. 
When Gaelic law spurned her as a female chieftain, oh, O'Malley ignored the political and social obstacles placed in her path. Such was her influence and power that she became an accepted matriarch, not merely to her own followers, but of neighboring clans whose own chieftains had either died or abandoned their obligations to protect their followers. Interesting. She had that much influence that the chieftains and clans around her basically just saw her as a matriarch, saw her as a queen, a ruler, and did what they could to just protect and kind of went with her so that her their areas, their clans would be safe and be protected. They went with her and made her the ruler. That says a lot about her leadership. Either it's through her charisma, her strength, her story of all that she's lost gave her that fuel to really be a leader. I find that interesting. A rogue pirate now becoming this leader and going against Gaelic law, English law, whatever was kind of established just to be her own leader, her own person, her own influence. She's cool. <laughs> Dang. Here we go. I need to keep going. I'm intrigued here, guys. <laughs> this is... Her story has been somewhere, so I want to know. I want to see how this goes. The English, however, of course, wished to put O'Malley in her place. Sir Richard Bingham, who was made governor of Connaught in 1584, became a lifelong enemy of O'Malley and her family, claiming that she was a nurse to all rebellions in the province for this 40 years. Yeah, okay. I had to do a little exaggeration on that because, yikes, men. Uh, <laughs> sorry, men, but this seems like a typical man. Like, how dare she have all this power? It's ridiculous. She's had too much influence for 40 years. It's time to put her down. Yeah. So, in 1586, O'Malley's eldest son, Owen, was killed by Bingham's brother. What? When a heartbroken O'Malley led a force against Bainham, she was lured into a trap and captured. No! <laughs> Dang. At the age of 56, she was condemned to death before her son-in-law Richard managed to persuade the English that he was not part of any rebellion and would keep O'Malley in his custody. Interesting. Her son-in-law, Richard, so her husband Bork, that's oh interesting her son-in-law richard sorry wait so she had a daughter married richard richard told the english that they're loyal to the english and would keep his mo mother-in-law in custody huh i think this uh son-in-law has learned a little bit from his mother-in-law do you think Okay, so she's in her son-in-law's custody. Okay. So, in reality, once freed, both rejoined the rebels. Ah, oh, there it is. There's that statement we needed. So they pledged loyalty to the English just to keep them together, the son-in-law and uh, O'Malley. But then, boom, <laughs> once they were freed, the British were done with them, the English were kind of happy with whatever they stated and said, they rejoined the rebels. I love it. In 1587, O'Malley took advantage of Bainham being sent away to visit his rival, the new Lord Deputy of Dublin, Sir John Parrott, who pardoned her for all of her past offenses, as well as those of her children. Ah. Aha. So she won over this new Lord Deputy of Dublin, and he pardoned her. Look, it took away all of her charges, her crimes, all of those things from her and her children. And so this Bingham, who's been against her, went to go see him and visit him. <laughs> That's great. So she got pardoned completely during that whole period and exchange. The official line now was that O'Malley would retire to live a quiet life and stop her plundering at sea. However, this was far from the truth. 
Sounds like it. It sounds like this deputy of Dublin was like, I've talked to her. I've pardoned her. And in exchange for pardoning her, she's agreed to stop messing around with the seas and be live a quiet life. She's not going to plunder or anything. She's just, she's going to be quiet. That sounds like what kind of happened there. Kind of a bargaining deal between these two people. And Bingham probably agreed. And, well, that didn't happen. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I love this. I'm like on the edge of my seat here reading an article for this podcast episode. I'm just like, what happens now? (laughs) Oh, I love it. Okay, onwards. In the summer of 1588, Bingham returned to Ireland amid fears that the Spanish Armada would find Irish supporters. Skirmishes between his forces and O'Malley's continued for several years until he destroyed part of her fleet of galleys in the early 1590s. Huh. So they were basically fighting against each other. He was really only there to protect, um, not really protect, but basically make sure none of the Irish joined the Spanish sides of things because the Spanish had quite a lot of influence in this time period. So the fact that he was there, he was just like, no, the Spanish are getting to Ireland. They're mine. And that led him to fight O'Malley as often and frequently as possible, it looks like. But unfortunately, she lost here, it looks like. However, not one to admit defeat, O'Malley bypassed Bingham and appealed directly to his boss. Her first of many letters to Queen Elizabeth I show a mind as Machiavelli. Machiavellian and sophisticated as that of Elizabeth and her court. I'm not surprised because as we go back a little bit in the article, it does say that she is educated and she had received the highest amounts of education as possible for a woman in this time period. So the fact that her letters and the way she wrote sounded very sophisticated and that of royal sounding or royal education almost i'm not surprised most people think pirates are probably like they're very clever they're wise they're able to you know plunder and fight and they're strong and they're amazing i don't think many people think that they would be intelligent though so that's where probably a lot of people are surprised like whoa this woman who's caused havoc for us for years actually has an intelligent mind I love it. So, but let's see what's in these letters here. Uh, here. In the letter, O'Malley sets out her own version of the events, which, as she writes, constrained her to take up arms, laying the blame squarely at Bingham. At Bingham. Ah, so she wrote her account of all the things that have happened and made it sound as if it's just this Bingham's fault, her rival. It's his fault. All these things happened and she made it sound like it was absolutely his fault and he'd gone rogue or gone mad, basically. I love that. Okay, next. Oh dear. In retaliation, Bingham captured her son, Theobald, and accused him of of treason, a crime punishable by death. To save the life of her son, O'Malley followed her correspondence to the royal court and, with the assistance of her friend, the influential Earl of Ormond, managed to get an audience with Elizabeth in, Green- in Greenwich in July 9th, 1593. Whoa. She was that desperate that she sent the letter, but then decided to keep go with the messenger and got an audience with Elizabeth I in Greenwich in July 1593. She was that desperate to save her son. I mean, it makes sense. She already lost a son. She lost three of her past lovers and people. So she didn't want to lose any more. I think that makes heckin' sense. But I wonder how this audience went with the queen. Yet, staring across the chamber at the queen, she was not intimidated. Instead, defiant and determined. Both women were the same age, and both queens in O'Malley's eyes. Of course. Of course she sees herself as queen. Um, when basically she was established as one. 
from the clans and chieftains around uh, Rockfleet, but not really titled as a queen, per se, like Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth wore an, wore an exquisite dress, wig, and makeup, while O'Malley let her age show. It was clear she was no ordinary woman. As the queen could not speak Irish, they resorted to a language they both knew. Latin, do you think? Probably Latin. So Chambers elaborates, this is her biographer. Tradition holds that Elizabeth and O'Malley conversed in Latin, Hey, However, both from her correspondence and the reports of those who came into contact with her, it is obvious that O'Malley both understood and spoke English. <laughs> so she did that as a sign of, I'm intelligent, I can speak this other language, I know Irish as well, but I can speak to you in this other language, and hopefully that will have a connection, some sort of, maybe she could understand her, or understand her intelligence and her reasons as to why she's there. That's really, really clever. She could have spoke English, but instead she chose Latin, a language that they both were educated in. Very clever. Oh, I love this. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> okay, this next section here is titled Kindred Spirits. Ooh, sounds like she may have won the queen over a little bit here. Let's see. Elizabeth was in awe of this woman, a fellow female leader in a male-dominated world, and took pity on O'Malley. The queen allowed her to return to maintenance by land and sea, an authorized form of piracy allowing O'Malley to recover her losses, and called for Theobald's release. Such was the impression made on Elizabeth that when a new map of Ireland was drawn, O'Malley was named as Chieftain of Mayo. There you go, an official title was given to her. Wow. She saved her son. When they drew up more borders of Ireland and gave her Mayo, all of Mayo. Dang. That is remarkable. If you think about it, that is remarkable. Wow. That really shows how persuasive she was, how influential she was, probably a little bit of charis charis charisma, sorry, charisma in there as well, and her intelligence. She knew exactly what to do and what to say to get that. That is so remarkable. Okay, sorry, I'm going to keep going here. Oh my gosh. Okay, so O'Malley continued leading her men at sea until well into her 60s. But a new century brought great change. The Battle of Kinsale in 1602 put an end to rebellion and left Ireland to fall into English hands. And the Gaelic way of life O'Malley and her ancestors had lived by crumbled. Yeah. Sounds about right. I mean, the English and Irish were always against each other for numbers of years, number, number of years, but eventually they did manage to overpower them in, in the 1600s. So I remember that from, oddly from my history of the English language class, which I might have to do a podcast on as well. But I remember that a little bit where unfortunately the Irish just couldn't keep up their defenses in the rebellion and they lost. So this battle of Kinsale, um, cause that for sure. Okay, so one year later. In 1603, O'Malley died at Rockfleet, the same year as Elizabeth. Oh, born the same year, died the same year. That is really poetic. <laughs> and kind of sweet and sad at the same time. These two prominent, powerful matriarchs, basically, born in the same year and died the same year. Oh, that, like, that's, that's very poetic. Damn. So, O'Malley's story is not widely known. Her legacy has survived through the folk tales and songs of Ireland. Grace O'Malley did not conform to the patriotic, 
God-fearing and dutiful image of Gaelic womanhood promoted by later generations of Irish historians, and was consequently airbrushed. So yeah, they overlooked her because obviously her influence wasn't enough to change the culture and the ideas around womanhood at that time. She was that unique standalone story that people were like, okay. And then historians just kind of brushed aside. So we only know of these things from like her written accounts that obviously they were able to quote in this article. Her correspondence between the queen and herself and others. And that's how they were able to kind of piece together her story. That is really interesting. But yeah, as um, her biographer Chambers has said here, she did not conform to patriarchy. She said, screw that. I am someone who craves power, who craves to have an influence, who needs it. I've been burned. I've had my husband's killed. I've had my boyfriend killed. I've had a son be killed. Enough is enough. And really, instead of letting that grief consume her, or like what a typical woman would be consumed by, I guess, in the sense of like depression, sadness, drinking, those awful ways to deal with grief, she was like, no, I need to avenge them. I need to make sure I do everything in my power that no one forgets them, that I take control of what was theirs for their honor and for my own honor, for my own power, for my own stance. That's phenomenal. She wasn't so obviously a superhero. I mean, piracy, plundering, killing people, taking their ships, all that kind of stuff. Of course, there's that side to it. But all of it, it seems, from the story and the folk tales and things that have been passed down, It really just seems she was doing it for her kids, for her husbands, for her boyfriend, for herself, and just wanted to really say no to a life that kept throwing a lot at her. And I think that's a lot of, that's respect. That's complete respect. There is a little bit more to this, unfortunately, but I can't look at it because I'm not, I don't have an account with the website. But it looks like um, there is articles that have been written about her and one article here says, uh, or from Anne Chambers, the actual article and uh, biography she wrote of her. It's called uh, Grace O'Malley, the Biography of Ireland's Fire Queen, 1530 to 1603. So if you guys are interested like I am, I'm going to write that down, actually, and bookmark this article. I want to read more. She is a phenomenal woman. To have survived all of that and more, really. Being captured, being released, finding her own release, having her connection with her family for a release against the English. And then having her son get released, and who knows what happened to the actual Lord, um, Lord Bingham. I want to find out if he got punished for it. Uh, It's not stated in this article today, of course, but I want to find out if he got punished for that based on her appeal to the Queen directly in Greenwich. I really want to know that, if that was a thing that happened. But man, what a woman! (laughs) I have a girl crush with someone who died in 1603. Don't worry about it. But, wow. There is a lot of stuff you can take from her. Her resilience. Her ability to lead in the face of adversity. And such like that. Like, remarkable. A lot of things that we should find in ourselves, maybe not to the extent of, you know, piracy, murder, killing, lying, escaping, all that kind of stuff, but just to deal with difficulties in life. I think that's phenomenal. I am going to remember that story for the rest of my life, I think. That is so crazy. And the fact that it got buried in Irish history 
because again of course the culture just grew and adapted and with the English taking over and like all these different influences on Ireland themselves of course there is a shift from like women having a chance to own land and be rulers and have the same power as their husbands or similar power of course when it came to history and change and culture adapting and adjusting to all these different influences that probably got lost and it probably got changed and shifted to what we now know as typical in that time period where women had to stay at home weren't very educated if they were that means they came from a pretty well-off family they didn't have the right to vote or have power or own land and it just went backwards after that point so the story got buried because of that but I hope people look into this more I think it'd be nice to have this hero hero villain anti-hero maybe <laughs> might be the best way to call her or best thing to call her and just give it a look at because I think a lot of this stuff is remarkable even the facts that we didn't know about this trial marriage for example and women were able to own land and have land for themselves were able to get married and divorced too some of these things i didn't even know existed before like current days you know that is really cool and i think yeah, I think her story and the way this article is written and all the things that is revealed about Ireland or at least maybe the west coast of Ireland here is really cool and fascinating and yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> this is a bit of a shorter episode, but I'm just at this point gawking over her and her story and loving it like a lot. So I'm going to end it here. <laughs> hope you guys found uh, Grace O'Malley in interesting like I did and fascinated. Let me know your thoughts down below and thank you for joining me in the Dragon's Den. I hope you enjoyed this little history extra and unique history and I will see you guys in Stardew on Monday and another unique history next Thursday. Thank you everybody. Take care and bye bye.